glorious Lord, how great it is to come and worship together, to pray together, to begin to experience Advent as we lead up to Christmas, to do that together. But God, it's also great to hear your word together. And even though you'll speak directly to us as individuals, you speak to us as a church. And we thank you for that gift. God, I ask humbly that your voice would work through mine to speak into our everyday lives. In Christ's name, amen. So let me tell you a bit about the sermon series we're going into over the next few weeks. It's going to follow Advent. And what I want to do is pick out a couple of places and a couple of people and really highlight them. So today we're going to be looking at the town of Nazareth. We'll also look at Joseph. We'll look at the town of Bethlehem. And we'll look at Mary. And that will take us from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So as I begin this, uh, let me give you a few facts about Nazareth. Um, if you thought Bethlehem was small, you should have lived in Nazareth in Jesus' day. They estimate the population of Nazareth in Jesus' day as somewhere between one and 400 people. No bigger than 400 people. That is one small town. Probably didn't have a Walmart. Itty bitty town. Okay? So Nazareth is very small in population. What did people do that lived in that town? Well, they were mostly uh, farmers or laborers or, or sheep herders. That's all they did. What was the biggest town that was close to them? If you wanted to go to Walmart, where would you go? You'd go to a town called Sepphoris. Sepphoris had a population of about 30,000. It was known for its trade. It was known to be a culture center. There was a lot of stuff that the Greek and the Hebrew folk did there that spoke of or celebrated their culture. Sepphoris was also very wealthy, very wealthy town. In fact, folk who were in Nazareth would often go to Sepphoris because that's where they were employed. And Nazareth would become essentially the bedroom community as they worked in Sepphoris. What about the name? What does the name Nazareth mean? Well, there's a couple of theories. Uh, one theory is it comes from a Hebrew word that means root. And where they tie that in is to say that the Old Testament promised that a Messiah would come from the root of King David's family. That one day a Messiah would come and he would be related to David. And the connection then is that Nazareth is where Jesus is from, and that must be verifying the fact that there was this root. Well, there's a little problem with that. Raymond, uh, Robert, if you can put up uh, John 1, uh, verse 45. Here's the problem. If, uh, if you consider that this was a root or a prophecy about Jesus, then why would this happen? Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Next slide. Nazareth, he says, can anything good come from there? Well, if Nazareth was a town whose name was tied with a very positive prophecy that the Messiah would come from the root of David, there's no ways anyone would say, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? That was a term of derision or a statement of derision. What's a lot more likely is that Nazareth comes from the Hebrew word, which means to guard or to protect. See, Nazareth was up on a hill and overlooked the Galilean plain. Nazareth is, if you look at it, is way north in Israel, uh, near the Sea of Galilee, just a little west of the Sea of Galilee. And it looked out over the Galilee plains, kind of like a watchtower. A good place to be to see your enemies coming. So that's probably where the name uh, is, or what the name is associated with. Last fact, or thing of interest. Where was Jesus born? Not a trick question. 
So shouldn't it be Jesus of Bethlehem, not Jesus of Nazareth? Well, let me tell you this. I was actually born in Manchester, England. But when people say to me, where do you come from? I say, South Africa. Because even though I was born in England, I was just a baby when my folks moved to South Africa. And I was raised in South Africa. So I always say I'm from South Africa, not from England. No offense, Tim. Uh, same thing with Jesus and Nazareth and Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem and was a baby. But he grew up in Nazareth. That's where he was raised. So it's Jesus of Nazareth. And that's where that, that uh, connection comes in. So let's, let's ask, ask the question, can anything good come from Nazareth? Yes. Water. You see, one of the things that Nazareth was known for was it had a well that had a plentiful supply of good water. That was very, very important in Jesus' day. Nazareth was known for that. But there's a little play on words going on here. Okay? Because in the story where Jesus interacts with the Samaritan woman, he speaks about the fact that he is the source of living water. Now, where that comes from ties back into the Old Testament to the prophet Jeremiah. So let, let me connect the dots for you. Raymond, if we can go to our Jeremiah 2.13 passage. This is God speaking to Israel through the prophet uh, Jeremiah. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. They have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So here's the problem that God is facing with Israel. Israel has become self-dependent, not God-dependent. Even though Israel is at the point where they are now pretty much broken as a nation, God is still trying to reach out to them, and they are still stubbornly saying, We'll do it our way. And even though God gets angry with them, and even though God says, this is judgment day, God still leaves a door open for Israel because God loves for them and cares for them. Even when God feels like I am at the end of my rope with you guys, it's time to shut this nation down, God leaves a door open and says to them, I am the source of living water. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to be your own source and you're trying to fill a broken cistern. You need to come to me, say, God says to Israel, to find true meaning and true nourishment in life. Along comes Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Literally a place where good water was available figuratively a place where Jesus says, I am the water of life, the fountain of life. So let's go to John chapter 4, verse 10, and we'll connect this with, with Jesus. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, who he should not even be interacting with, first she was a Samaritan, secondly she was a woman on her own. You didn't, guys didn't really do that where they were that forward. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Next verse. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where will you get this living water? If you look at the next verse, she says, well, are you saying you're greater than our father Jacob? And then comes verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, referring to the water in the well at Samaria. But in verse 14, he says, but those who drink the water I, Jesus, give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So you have the, the literal and the figurative going on here. The literal for the woman of Samaria is she is at a well taking water out of the well. She needs that water. Her family needs that water. That's nourishment for them. 
Jesus says on the play on the words water, I am the nourishment for you. The God whom you long for, the God whom you've forgotten about though, is the one who is your source of meaning and strength in life. And Jesus says, you need to connect with me to experience that strength, that source of living water. So now the question becomes, how do we do that? It's easy to get water out of a well, assuming the water in there is good, tie a rope on a bucket handle, lower it, and pull the bucket back up. But how do you, how do you connect with Jesus Christ, the water of life? Well, Jesus says here in this passage, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water. If Jesus gives it, all I have to do is receive it. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as tying a rope on a bucket, dropping it down, and receiving the water that's in the bottom. In the literal sense with Jesus, it's simply saying, Christ, come into my life. Christ, will you be the water in my life? Christ, in the middle of this broken cistern, will you be the one who gives me value and strength and meaning? Christ, I want to follow you because the direction I have followed has not always been a healthy one. It's simply responding to the invite that Jesus uh, gives to us. As simple as that. Now, I, I will grant you this. I have heard many testimonies from people for whom that moment of connection with Christ is the living water, who in that moment where they gave their lives to Christ, they had a dramatic turnaround. People who used drugs, whose life was going down the drain, they gave their life to Christ, they turned 180 degrees and became a pastor. People who, whose life was just filled with a criminal history, their lives turned around, they became a missionary. Dramatic conversions. People whom society was ready to throw away, they meet Christ, they accept Christ's gift of living water, they give themselves to Christ, their life is radically changed. But my guess is that for most folk, that's not the case. The lives that have that dramatic change are like the city of Sepphoris. There's wealth, there's attraction, there's something there that's very visible, something there that's very desiring. Compared to Nazareth, that seems to be a waste of time. If you blinked as you drove through it, you'd miss it. That sometimes our conversion experience or our moment of meeting Christ seems to be dull in comparison to others. I mean, some of you may have grown up in a Christian home and realized one day, I've been following Jesus. That's the way that I was raised. It may not be that dramatic moment. I want to tell you a story uh, written by a guy called Charles Moore in his book, The Powerful Witness of Community. And Charles tells a story about a guy called Alan. They were both physics majors at Cal Poly. And he said the first thing that struck him about Alan, that amazed him about Alan, was that Alan became a physics major, even though he could see in distance, he couldn't see close up. And Charles said what was fascinating to him is Alan would have to put his nose two inches away from the paper to be able to read what was there. Alan eventually went on to be an instructor, a teacher at Cal Poly. Charles says that Alan, even though he had a, a background in, in Judaism, was a, a strong non-believer. And his sense was, as a scientist, there was simply not enough evidence to prove God's existence. That there was not enough evidence to prove that Jesus was indeed God. Alan said, it's not that I'm an atheist, it's that I'm an agnostic. I just simply do not find the evidence that would convince me as a scientist that God is for real. And Alan said, Charles said that he and Alan and some of Charles' friends would often get into this discussion, and sometimes it would turn pretty lively, but they'd often get into this discussion about the Bible, and Charles would try and tell him, you know, 
based on Scripture and, and, and based on some of the history um, that we know about Christ and His times, for him, God was real. And Alan just came from the point of view of saying, no, there's not, it is insufficient evidence for me. But Charles said one of the things that fascinated him was that Alan would always hang out with them, Charles and his Christian friends. I'll read to you what Charles writes in his book about Alan. He says, Alan didn't have many friends. He was rather unattractive, much too serious, and totally dependent on others for any kind of transportation. And Charles said, myself, my friends, we tried to reach out to Alan as much as we could and just be his friend. He'd come with us to Taco Bell. He'd come sit with us on the beach when we'd light a fire and just sit around the fire. And if any of you lived in California or been there, it's a beautiful place to light a fire on a beach because it gets a little cold in the evenings and it's just a great place to gather around. Well, Charles continues the story and he says, one day, Alan had gone down with his friends to the beach and his friends had gathered around the fire as usual, but that night someone had a guitar and they started singing, you know, praise songs like we sing here. And something happened in Alan. And very quietly, doesn't say this aloud, very quietly he said, Christ, will you come into my life? Didn't say anything more. Didn't tell anyone in the circle. Just prayed that very simple prayer. He went to Charles the next day. And he said, I've become a follower of Christ. Charles was amazed. He said, but Alan, you told me that there was insufficient evidence for you as a scientist to prove that Christ was who he was, who he said he was. And Alan said, my job as a scientist is to look at all the evidence. And he said, there was one piece of evidence that I failed to, 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 to pay attention to. And that was you guys. And he said, I realized that, that when I am the happiest, it's because I am with you as Christians. That when I have people who I see have, have deep meaning in life, it's because I look at you guys as Christians. He said, that ev evidence I had totally neglected. The power in Alan and Charles' uh, uh, experience is the ordinary. Let me say that again. The power in that story is the ordinary. Never underestimate the power of the ordinary. Never underestimate what can come out of Nazareth. Never underestimate the quietness in how God moves in some occasions in our lives. The fact that your conversion story isn't as dramatic as somebody like, say, Jesse DePlantis doesn't make your conversion invalid. It doesn't make his any less true, but it doesn't make yours any less true. If for most of you, your encounter with God, your moment of truth, your moment of understanding that God is forgiving and merciful and loving and caring, if that was a quiet moment and it was a quiet prayer you prayed in your heart and it was a Nazareth experience for you, that is just as powerful and counts just as much. God does not discriminate between a Jesse DePlantis turnaround story or a Paul. If you read the book of Acts and read about Paul, who was once Saul of Tarsus, he has the most incredible conversion experience. But yours is no less significant to God than Saul's was. Yours is just as valid. And the story that your life shares, that comes from the ordinary, can speak just as strongly to others. Charles said, we get in pretty heated arguments with Alan, but we never lost our friendship. We were always friends. And it was simply that friendship that spoke volumes to Alan when he finally realized what was going on. A group of guys living ordinary Christian lives touched someone else's life who had a very ordinary conversion experience. 
never underestimate the power of the ordinary. Never feel insignificant. Never feel like you don't have something to offer. Never feel like your life is so Im diminished compared to someone who has this great testimony that, that your life can't speak to someone else's. Never think that. God can work through you as powerfully as he can work through Billy Graham. And you may say, well, I've never spoken to a stadium filled with 100,000 people and then had half of them come down. No, you haven't. That's okay. God has called you to be you. God has gifted Billy Graham to be Billy Graham. Never underestimate the power of the ordinary. How about we pray? God, thank you. Thank you for accepting us just as we are. Thank you, God, that we don't have to be super spiritual. Thank you, God, that you don't love us any more or less because of our experience of you. Thank you, God, that your forgiveness and your understanding and your compassion are not dealt out based on how extraordinary our stories are. Thank you, God, for accepting us for who we are. Friends, there may be some of you today who have realized that Christ is the living water and that everything seems to be leaking out of your broken system. Or maybe it's just a question you've had for a long, long time and you want to change that. If so, just quietly say this prayer in your hearts after me. God, thank you for loving me. God, I know I haven't always lived my life in the way you have wanted me to. Forgive me for that. Christ, come into my life. I want to be your follower. I want you to direct me. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to gather together and uh, <coughs> spend a, a time around a meal celebrating the ordinary. Um, so I'd ask two things. Those of you who are kids with smaller kids, if you're parents with smaller kids, if you'll go get your kids now and we'll celebrate communion together. In this uh, church, our table is an open table. You don't have to be anybody special or unique to come and celebrate communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be United Methodist. Christ died with his arms outstretched with a lot of symbolism about his invitation to everyone. And that's what we celebrate around this table. It's an invitation to everyone. So everyone is welcome to share this meal together. Wayne, thank you for that sermon today. It's a wonderful story. I like that. Uh, we've got one more to close out. And I uh, ask that you all stand and sing along. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! with me how great is our God oh we'll see how great how great is our God age to age he stands 
with me how great is our God oh we'll see how great how great is our God thank you for standing in for Kevin today really appreciate your leadership Friends, let's say our closing thought together. No one can help everyone, but everyone can help someone. Friends, go in peace.